In Luke 23, we're going to be covering Jesus' trials, his death, and his burial. He has already been tried three times by the time we get to chapter 23, three times by the, by the Jews, the Sanhedrin. He's going to be tried three times by Pilate on two occasions and by Herod as well before Pilate is going to deliver him over to death. I'll begin reading in, chapter, in verse 1 of chapter 23. Then the whole company of them arose and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding us to give tribute to Caesar, and saying that he himself is, king, is Christ, a king. And Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him, You have said so. Then Pilate said to the chief priests in the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they were urgent, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching throughout all Judea, from Galilee even to this place. What are the charges that these Jews make against Jesus before Pilate? He stirs up the people. He's an insurrectionist. Okay? The other charge is he claims to be a king. Okay? He claims to be a king. That's not the charge the Sanhedrin came up with in their last meeting. What was the charge they came up with there? Blasphemy. Blasphemy. Okay? He claims to be God. Well, I don't think Pilate's going to care about that charge. I don't think Pilate's going to overlook that one. So they need a civil charge to present to Pilate. And the most threatening one, it seems to Pilate, was he claimed to be a king. So this seems to be the charge that Pilate's going to address the most. Okay? I think Pilate spent time with Christ, and Pilate realized this man is no insurrectionist. But a conversation recorded in John chapter 18 denies Pilate's or the Jews' charge that he is a insurrection, um, rebellion, leadership-seeking, political king. When Pilate asked him in John 18, are you a king then? Jesus said, you say rightly I am a king for this cause was I born for this cause? Did I come into the earth? But he also said, my kingdom is not of this world. And he convinced Pilate that he was no threat to Pilate or Caesar. Okay? So when, when he spent a little time with Jesus, he tells these Jews, I find nothing guilty about this man. He also learns, though, that Jesus is from Galilee. So he says, I want to send him to Herod because he is from Herod's jurisdiction. So Pilate's got a hot potato in his hands, and he wants rid of it. And he sees Herod as his opportunity to get rid of Jesus. So he doesn't have to make this decision. Okay? We're going to go to the trial before Herod next. Does anyone have any thoughts before we leave this, this context? Okay. Let's look at verses 6 through 12. When Pilate heard this, he asked him whether the man was, was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him over to Herod, who was himself in Jerusalem at the time. When Herod saw Jesus, he was very glad, for he had long desired to see him, because he had heard about him, and he was hoping to see some sign done by him. What do we know about this Herod? About his recent history? He killed John the Baptist. Okay. And then when he started to hear about the miracles of Jesus, what did he say who Jesus was? 
He is John the Baptist come from the dead. Okay? He was fearful of Jesus. Apparently he's gotten over that fear. He's heard more good stories about Jesus apparently because he wants to see Jesus perform a miracle in his eyes. Verse 9. So he questioned him at some length, but he made no answer. There's no other record of this conversation between Herod and Jesus. I call it a conversation. It was a one-way conversation. As far as we know, Jesus never said a word to him. Apparently, this made Herod angry, and he started mocking Jesus, showed contempt toward him, as did his men. And we see that through verses 10 through 12. I'm not going to read that in the interest of time. But they mocked him. They held him in contempt. They hated him. They put a robe on him to make him look like a king, mockingly, and they sent him back to Pilate. But Herod found nothing that Jesus had done that was worthy of death. Okay? Let's continue in verse 13. Pilate then called together the chief priests and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I do not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod, for he sent him back to us. Look, nothing deserving of death has been done by him. I will therefore punish and release him. What does it mean to punish him? I'm going to scourge him. I'm going to beat him. Okay? Why would he do that to an innocent man? Why is he seeking this compromise? He doesn't want to kill Jesus. I'm sorry? Wants to humiliate Jesus? Okay. I think he wants to appease the Jews. Yeah, I think he wants to appease the Jews. Let's continue in verse 18. But they all cried out together, Away with this man and release to us Barabbas. Who is Barabbas? Verse 19. He is a... He is an insurrectionist. Okay? He's your true insurrectionist. He's also said to be... A murderer. Okay? Verse 20. Pilate addressed them once more, desiring to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, Crucify him, crucify him. A third time he said to them, Why? What evil has he done? I have found in him no guilt deserving death. I will therefore punish and release him. But they were urgent demanding with loud cries that he should be crucified, and their voices prevailed. So Pilate decided that their demand should be granted. Should be granted, the scriptures say. He released the man who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder, for whom they asked, but he delivered Jesus over to their will. How many times did Pilate say, I find nothing wrong with this man? Three times. And yet, I'm going to punish him. In fact, I'm going to give him over to you after all, just because you are a mob. Tell me some things you think about Pilate. What do you think about his character? He's a weak man. He's a politician, isn't he? He's a, he's a weak man. What else, Matt? John says when people are yelling that he's no friend of Caesar, that anyone who says they're a king is, is against Caesar. And, and, you know, these are strange times, too. He, he had every reason to believe he could be killed pretty quickly. Yep. And I'd say that making excuses, right? But I, I know lots of people that do bad things that aren't as serious that we make excuses for all the time. We, we, we care. Yep. 
I would say he's a coward. Did I say hand up over here? Okay. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and reason went out the window completely. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. All logic, anything related to justice is gone at this point. Look at the things that Pilate ignored. Before I say that, let me, let me indicate this. In Matthew 27, he washed his hands. He said, I am innocent of this man's blood. And their reply was, his blood be on us and our children. Well, his blood will be on them and their children in one of two ways. Either as guilty of murder, in which case they're going to be lost, or his blood will be on their hands because they're going to repent and they're going to be saved. One way or the other, the blood of Christ is on them. Most of them were not saved. I think history records that for us. How many of us today know how we ought to treat Jesus and we treat him just the opposite? How many people today know Jesus and know that he's worthy of praise, worthy of honor, worthy of kingship, worthy of their obedience, and yet they refuse. His blood's on them, too. So Pilate is weak. He's, I think he's selfish. He's also a coward. Pilate and Herod knew that he was innocent. Pilate knew that they were being that they were pursuing Christ because of envy. It's recorded in Matthew and Mark. Because of envy, he knew that they were trying to kill him. Pilate's wife had a dream, and she told him, I want you to have nothing to do with this righteous man. So he had all these indications of what he should do, but he didn't do it. Okay? Let's continue with verse 26. <clears throat> and as they led him away, they seized one Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, and laid on him the cross to carry it behind Jesus. And there followed him a great multitude of the people and of women who were mourning and lamenting for him. But turning to them, Jesus said, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it was dry? In Luke chapter 21, we studied the prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem. I believe Jesus is referring to that here when he speaks to the daughters of Jerusalem. Do not weep for me. Weep for your children and for yourselves. 
a reminder of what's coming, the terrible fate that lays ahead for Jerusalem. Now, when we studied that chapter, we didn't get to cover the last few verses because of time. So let me make a point here that we wanted to make then. The destruction of Jerusalem that was prophesied by Jesus, the destruction of Jerusalem itself is a type of the destruction, the judgment that will come upon all who are sinners. When Jesus closed out Luke chapter 21, there's a warning to watch. Be watchful. Be prepared. Whether you're in Jerusalem, outside Jerusalem, he's telling us you be watchful. That's a lesson for us in the destruction of Jerusalem. We do not know the day that the Lord is coming. We're to be watchful. Okay? Perhaps in verse 30, Jesus is looking beyond the destruction of Jerusalem when he talks about how men will respond to say to ask the mountains to fall on us. This happened two other times, or was recorded two other times in the scriptures. One is in Hosea, where it talks about the judgment of Samaria, and the leaders are saying, Fall on us, spare us this fate at the hands of God. Similar thing in Revelation chapter 6, where it says, Kings of the earth and all the influential people of the earth are going to say, Hide me from the face of him on the throne. Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. Is Jesus warning these ladies of Jerusalem about the destruction of Jerusalem? Yes. Is he going even beyond that and warning all of us? I think so. Verse 31. What do you think it means? If they do these things when the wood is green, what will happen when it is dry? Any thoughts? David? Yep, I think that's exactly right. You could also think of it this way. The Romans are going to destroy Jerusalem in AD 70 because of Rome's or Jerusalem's rebellion against Rome. Time and time again, Rome has, has tried to squelch rebellions in Jerusalem. In AD 70, they've had enough. Jesus may be saying, if they're going to do this to the one who is innocent, who they perceive and they admit is innocent, what are they going to do to the ones that they perceive as guilty? Okay? He also may be saying this. If God, using them, is willing to punish me, what will he do to the guilty. Okay? If they do this to the wood that's green, what will they do to the wood that's dry? Okay? What will they do to that that's not worthy? And what will they do to that that's worthy of punishment? Okay? Any other thoughts? Okay, let's continue with verse 32. <clears throat> Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. What prayer did Jesus make on behalf of his enemies here? Forgive them. 
Okay? Jesus said, love your enemies. Okay? And that's exactly what Jesus did right here. He has a forgiving heart towards them always. And he asked the Father to give them opportunity to repent. And when they do repent, forgive them. Okay? What time did Jesus die? Do you know? About the sixth hour. I'm sorry? About the sixth hour. Sixth hour, which would be? Three o'clock. Three o'clock. How long was he on the cross? Six hours. Six hours. He was hung at nine, at 9 a.m. When did darkness fall on the land? Noon. About noon. So darkness is on the land for three hours, okay? Um, let's continue with verse 35. The people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The rulers scoffed at him. Anybody else? In this text, do you see anybody else scoffing at him? The criminals, at least one of the criminals on the cross. I think as Matthew tells us, both criminals railed at Christ on the cross. Other texts tell us people passing by mocked him, scoffed at him on the cross. The soldiers mocked him, we're told. People made fun of him saying, if, if he, if, let's see if Elijah will come and take him off this cross. So there's lots of mocking going on. It's not just the rulers that seem to imply it by, by Luke. Wayne? One would have to think that a lot of the people that saw Jesus crucified had seen him working miracles and or heard of the, I guess I'll say the years and months, if you will, that had passed when he was speaking and you know, basically hailed by many as the king of the Jews. Yep. For them to stand there at that point in time Yep. If they convinced all of those people to turn against Christ, they did. They pulled off a propaganda uh, scheme, didn't they? There were those there Pat, who were not mocking. There were those who watched from a distance who did not mock Christ. Okay. One of the criminals, verse thirty-nine. One of the criminals was. Who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. Several said to Jesus, Save yourself. But others rebuked him, saying, Do not fear God. Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? Now, just a few minutes before, this second criminal had also railed at Christ. But apparently he's repented. Okay? He has a fear of God. Verse 41, the man's still speaking. <clears throat> we indeed are under the same condemnation justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What does this criminal know about the coming of Jesus? We don't know. But apparently he believes Jesus is coming. And apparently he believes still while he's on the cross that Jesus is going to establish a kingdom. He understood Jesus is the Messiah. 
he felt in some way, in some way, this kingdom is still going to come. Because he said, remember me in your kingdom. And what was Jesus' reply? Verse 43, what was his reply? You shall be with me in paradise. There you have a man saved, a criminal saved without baptism. That's what we're taught, isn't it? He may have. We, we don't know. We don't know what his circumstance is. Okay? But people say, I don't need to be baptized because the criminal on the cross was never baptized. He lived under a different law. That's the proper response. Jesus' death is not complete yet. His blood is not available. His blood is not available prior to his death. He's not dead yet. Okay? Listen to this verse. If we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. I think of that verse every time I think of this criminal on the cross. He had the privilege. He had the privilege to die with Christ. But his privilege is not different from ours. We also have the privilege to die with Christ so that we might live with him. And we do that in baptism. And we die daily by continuing to give away those things, those sacrifices, those things that we give up because of who he is and because who we, who, of who we are in him. It was a privilege to this man to die with Christ. You, you and I should, should do it the same way. It is our privilege to die with Christ. Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, it is a trustworthy statement. Talking about men being saved. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. This criminal on the cross had a unique privilege to die with him physically, right then, right there. But his privilege is no greater than ours. We also die with Christ in baptism, according to Romans chapter 6. Okay, verse 44. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. What's the significance of the temple curtain tearing? I'm sorry? Access to God. The access to God is now changed. It is complete. How, how, how big was this, this veil? We're told it tore from top to bottom. You know how tall it was? I read it was 60 feet tall. I read it like a team of horses would find it difficult to pull this veil apart. It was so heavy. And yet it tore from top to bottom. Who tore it? God tore it. I'm sorry? Right. If you and I told we'd have to do it from, the, from bottom to top, wouldn't we? Okay? The veil was the access to God in the holiest, in the Holy of Holies. Now there is a new Holy of Holies brought about by the blood of Christ. There is a new temple. The temple of Jerusalem is now irrelevant. That's the significance of the veil being torn. All men have access to God through the blood of of Christ and through the intercession of Christ. I'm going to move on to verse 50. Now there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council and a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action and he was looking for the kingdom of God. Tell me what you know about Joseph of Arimathea.
He's a member of the Sanhedrin. Good and righteous man. He did not consent to what the Sanhedrin did when they condemned Jesus. What else do we know? John says he's a disciple of Jesus, though one secretly. Okay? We're also told that he was seeking the kingdom. He was a sincere Jew seeking the kingdom. We also know that he was a rich man. I forget, I didn't make note of the prophecy, but it's a prophecy where Jesus is identified with the rich. A prophecy about Joseph of Arimathea. Okay? What else do we know about Joseph? He asked for the body of Jesus. Okay? Mark says he boldly asked for the body of Jesus. It was not easy for him to go to Pilate and ask for that body. Do you know what they normally did with bodies that, hung, that were hung on a cross? Yeah. yeah, they left their bodies out in, out in the field to rot, okay? There was no such thing as respectable burial for, for these people who were shameful and, and they were, we were to have contempt for them, okay? Okay, we know that Joseph laid Jesus' body in, a, in his own tomb with the help of Nicodemus, another Jew, who sought the kingdom quietly. Okay, secretly. Okay, thank you all. I'm sorry we had to rush so quickly.